good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to uh, our uh, dialogue that comes within the Mufakir al Emirat uh, dialogue series. We are so excited to have you uh, with us today. I'm Wael Kishk, senior researcher at the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, and will be moderating this dialogue with our distinguished guest speaker, uh, Dr. Amina uh, Sumaiti, about empowering communities and the innovative solutions for power shortage uh, within the UN SDG 7th uh, goal. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amina, for, having, uh, for being with uh, us today. Uh, Dr. Amina Sumiti is an associate professor at Khalifa University and a member of Mufakiru al Emirat. It's a pleasure having you, Dr. Amina, with us today. Uh, starting with the uh, seventh goal of the United Nations SDG, uh, that's seeking uh, to ensure access, access to reliable and sustainable uh, energy at an uh, affordable cost, uh, access to electricity, increasing renewable energy, doubling energy uh, efficiency. Uh, electricity power is so important for all communities. It's vital for all uh, life activities, especially in developing countries and nations uh, with limited access to uh, electricity. Uh, looking at the reality, we can find some choking figures. Uh, for example, in uh, a recent uh, report published by the United Nations last year, is telling us that there is more than 600 million people in the world that still lack access to electricity, live without electricity. Uh, having said that, uh, can you please provide us with an overview on the current state of the global access to uh, energy? Um, thank you for the uh, introduction, and it's my pleasure being with you here today. So, imagine waking up every day where you don't have the assurance that you'll have electricity to charge your phone, or even access the internet. Or imagine that the situation is worse, such that you don't have the power to your house, the power to your uh, kids' schools, and to your workplace. This sounds really unrealistic. However, this is actually the reality for many people in many regions in developing countries and remote communities in developed countries even. So let's start with painting the picture of the magnitude of the current problem. According to the statistics, there are 1.3 billion people around the globe living in the dark, without even having the access to the electricity to supply their basic needs, such as the lights. And there are 770 million people around the globe who are residing in areas which lack sufficient electricity access. Such conditions has influenced the education, the access to medical services, and the employment, which consequently increased the poverty level in these countries. Now, what came to our mind is what are the reasons behind such a phenomena? This could be resonated to multiple factors. Among them, the decision of leaving these areas and non electrified, or to electrify part of the areas due to a shortage in electricity. It could be also a matter of a power system failure or a grid blackout, which means the whole grid will fail. And it could be one of the reasons could be because of the negative uh, gap between the power generation and electricity demand. And this is usually the matter when there is an increase in consumption, which is also a result of the population growth. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Amina. This was insightful and brings us to how big is the problem and the challenge the uh, world, many areas all over the world is still facing. Uh, having said that, and uh, we are still looking at the uh, facts, figures. The same United Nations report is still telling us that the current efforts, even the world is exerting a lot of efforts, but still not enough to achieve or to meet the ambitions uh, under the seventh goal of uh, SDGs. 
is telling us if we are proceeding like the business as usual efforts, we might reach 2030, while more than 600 million people still live in the dark. Having said that, how does the current challenge resonate with the United Nations SDG uh, ambitions? And could you elaborate more on uh, what would be tangible effects uh, might arise of that challenge? Um, okay. So, if we look at the countries suffering from the power generation shortage, these countries are actually facing challenges in meeting the Sustainable Development Goal number seven, which focuses on ensuring electricity access at an affordable, sustainable, and reliable manner for all. Now, if we look at examples that suffered from a power generation shortage, and we really call the history. For example, if we look at the year 2008 in Tajikistan, where the country has experienced the coldest weather of, uh, ever. During that time, the country has experienced a power failure, and that resulted in load shedding. And imagine what happened, that the doctors and nurses in the hospitals, they used to use hot water bottles just to keep the newborn babies warm. And many people have starved to death due to the lack of heat because there is no electricity to heat their rooms. Now, the situation in South Africa is even not that good because many regions in South Africa are lacking sufficient access to electricity for six hours daily. And if we look at India, many regions would have uninterrupted power supply for 10 to 12 hours daily. While in Pakistan, the situation is even worse where that number of hours could reach up to 15 hours. Now, this poses challenges to these communities in terms of having access to schools, hospitals, running their businesses, and then limiting their capacities to function in an effective manner. Thank you. I think uh, we might uh, still and continue talking about the challenges, but we need to get some hope looking at the solutions. So considering these challenges we have highlighted, uh, what would be the most prominent innovative solutions to tackle such challenges? Especially, for example, in some areas uh, which we call off-grid uh, areas, uh, which is so difficult for them in terms of the infrastructure uh, required to get access to electricity and being connected uh, to the grid. In the same vein, uh, we would like also to uh, know about the strategies that currently being employed by the electricity utilities and some uh, consumers to tackle such a challenge. That's a very interesting question because these utilities in developed countries has implemented different strategies. And these strategies are really variant, subject to how much power they have. If the consumers are residing, let's say, in a new area or even in a remote community or could be a rural area, one of the approaches is just to leave that area as unelectrified. The other approach is to supply 10% of that area, like 10% of the village with electricity, and then they say, well, this region is actually electrified. And the third approach is to follow a rotating load shedding. And when I talk about a rotating load shedding, I mean that all the areas that are connected to the power network, they are divided into zones. And they provide the electricity to these zones in non-overlapping periods, such that, let's say, the first region can, uh, in the grid would be, receive the, uh, the electricity, let's say, for five hours. But after these five hours finishes, okay, they're going to go into power interruption, and then they're going to provide another region with the electricity, such that the sequence becomes in a rotating order. Now, when it comes to the uh, consumers, consumers try to engage in solving that problem. So what they did is actually they started to adopt uh, new appliances which are energy efficient. Others who cannot afford these appliances in the market, so what they did, they sacrificed their heavy energy consumption devices. And one interesting fact that comes in, in the, from the Indian experience, that people in regions, they have formed supervisory committees, which look at the electricity usage and prevent electricity theft. 
because this is another contributing to factor why those people are really suffering from the power generation shortage. One of the successful examples was called uh, Akshay Yojana Parakesh, which has been implemented in India. That came up as an agreement between the consumers and the utilities. The utility promised that it will provide electricity to schools at the condition that the consumers will reduce 20% of their energy consumption. And actually, the consumers have sacrificed their appliances and they were able to meet the requirement. But after some time, that program was discontinued for the reasons that the utility couldn't meet that this obligation and their commitment to supply the electricity to what is, has been agreed on. So these are a couple of the uh, things that has arisen in developing countries uh, from the, uh, what I have been uh, seeing in the literature and in the real practice. Uh, thank you very much for such uh, insightful sharing with us, especially with regard to the examples that coming as representative examples uh, touching up with, uh, the problem and uh, what would be the most effective solutions uh, the society, the, uh, the utilities can uh, provide. Uh, in the triggered and moving, we are still in the, vein, the same vein of solutions but from other perspective, from the research community uh, perspective. Uh, can you share with us some examples of the recent efforts uh, at the level of the research community in dealing with such challenge? What uh, promising solutions and innovative solutions uh, that are being prepared or already uh, developed throughout the research uh, institutions? One of the interesting facts is that when we look at the electricity consumption growth rate, it's something linked with the population growth rate and the income of individuals. If we look, for example, in the situation for China in 1995, the number of air conditions were eight air condition units for 100 houses. But in nine years' time, that number has increased to be 106 for 100 houses. Now, predicting the energy consumption is one of the things that needs to be done in ahead, and anticipating the level of income of the consumers. Because as the level of income increases, definitely the consumers will go and purchase more appliances. The another aspect where researchers have looked at, especially in developing countries and remote communities, they looked at defining the best energy resources, which are basically renewables, and they go for off-grid applications. And they try to size these energy resources from the energy from the generation side perspective. But one of the things that is actually could be missed is the demand side of the consumers, because the consumer plays a vital role in the um, energy uh, consumption. And his demand should be really predicted accurately such that the utility can support his demand. Now, even if the researchers have decided to go with defining the optimal size of the renewable energy resources to support such communities, one of the big challenges is the availability of adequate infrastructure. And the financial cost for investment in these renewable energy resources. Now, to support these consumers, we need to, implement, to build new power generation plants and expand the existing infrastructure from the transmission and distribution networks to reach these communities. But there is a high capital cost of investment, and many governments and utilities are unable to support such a cost. So the option is to think about the private sector. But the private sector as well raises some concerns when it comes to facing this problem. They, cons they are concerned about the uncertainty and the risk factor associated with the problem because these communities are of low population densities and their income is very low. So they cannot justify the high capital cost and investment. And that leaves many communities till now without having the access to the electricity. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Amina, for sharing that, especially with regard to uh, not only the efforts being exerted uh, throughout the research community, but also the hurdles that still uh, persist such novel quest. 
uh, and looking at the private sector. And the private sector is still uh, everywhere looking for what incentives, what benefit uh, she, uh, they can get uh, throughout any initiative or uh, project. This brings us to uh, uh, an important and a global event uh, UAE has hosted last year, which is COP28. So after the historic uh, COP28 UAE consensus, we get a releasing and sharing with the globe uh, innovative initiatives, global goal for tripling renewable energy capacity, doubling energy efficiency uh, by 2030. Uh, we would like also to highlight what uh, some examples you can share with us on such innovative and promising initiatives that might push us forward uh, to find solutions, practical uh, solutions. Uh, in the same vein also, what approach do you propose as, as advice, uh, as a practical uh, solution uh, that might be used by uh, the community by the government in terms of, re for, for example, weaving the uh, innovative solutions and the strategic methodologies together to find some sort of uh, solution uh, for such uh, challenge. So I'll start from the fossil fuels themselves. Okay. Now, many people would think that. With the, la with the lack of the, finan the, uh, the financial resources to invest in renewable energy resources, that the fossil fuels is the only the option. However, there are three factors con contributing to why not we shouldn't invest. The first one is the political tension because these fossil fuels are associated with CO2 emissions. The other one is that these resources would be depleted. And the third challenge is that the location of these resources is far away from the load center, which again would mandate a transportation cost which these countries or these regions cannot really afford. Now, the initiative of COP28 is really amazing because COP28 hosted here in UAE brings governments and stakeholders to find innovative solutions for financing and also propose ideas or look at projects which can really be beneficial and would serve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal that we're talking about here today, which is Sustainable Development Goal number seven. So I'll talk about my personal research from that aspect. So what I have come up across my research, because that problem was really fancy and I was really hoping that I would solve one of the really challenges that affect the world. And to attain the welfare to the, to, the, to the people in these developing countries. I have designed a decision support tool. And that decision support tool serves multiple entities. One of them is the regulators, the other one is the power utilities, and the third one is the end users, which are the customers. So in that support tool, what we have looked at, we have looked at flexible financing. And that by flexible financing, I mean, if you look at the current regulations, if you want to go and invest in renewable energy project in developing countries, you're going to figure out that the financing is a bit of, I would say, strict in terms that these regulations are already defined. However, these types of regulations wouldn't fund all the investors. So different investors might need different financing options. So what we have done, we have developed a tool that would support that flexible financing by ensuring that at the end of the day that these investors will attain a reasonable rate of return. We looked also at the consumers. So what we have done, we said, okay, the first thing, let's look at the current scenario. What are the, utility, what are the utilities currently implementing in these developing countries? And we noticed that they do the rotating load shedding. But imagine, Let's say you're living in one city and the complete city is just living in the dark while the other city is living with lights. Now we said, is this really the sufficient options? Okay, or what should we think of to make the situation even better? So it's, we sa I said like, well, let's try to explore this. What if we try to electrify houses by houses on the same region? So. We're going to electrify one house while we're going to leave the other house in the dark. Okay? And we're going to see that we're going to able to maximize the opportunities within the same region. 
okay considering the total generation from the utility and considering how much is the total demand and the from the consumer side and we felt that this is would be much more beneficial at least let's say you want to watch your tv program and you don't have access to electricity you can definitely go visit your neighbor rather than having to pay for the transportation to go to another region to watch your favorite program so and then this was one of the options but we said well is this really going to solve the problem definitely not so we, we came up with a more advanced model which we looked at we looked at a survey on the what type of appliances are owned by the consumers in a household and we have developed really advanced models which model how these appliances operate in response to the temperature in response to the available electricity or its absence and in response to the comfort of the consumer and his availability in the house and we try to apply that strategy in response to a signal from the utility which says well i don't have sufficient electricity to supply you at that moment and then we were able we were able to increase the energy efficiency from 54% with load shedding to almost 99% with our proposed approach which again shows a huge potential and then we said well we're targeting to fully electrify the regions or at least make it very minimum okay such that at least the people would be able to overcome the poverty level and then we looked at optimal sizing of renewable energy resources now the challenge that many people are facing is that the, the high capital cost of investment and we say well we're not going to go for the gap between how much is available generation from utility and how much is really demand and to account that to size our renewable energy systems but rather we're going to incorporate the demand response which means focus on scheduling the end users appliances in response to the electricity utility signal and try to minimize the number or the sizes of renewable energy systems that we need and frankly speaking we really achieved really great results which are really beneficial and currently we're really hoping for some utilities at least to come and adopt our decision support tool which can validate it in real scenario and see if that's really going to have really an impact on communities in these countries and would at least make them meet the sustainable development goal number 7 uh, thank you dr amina i think such decision support tools is uh, very important for policy makers decision takers even the research community uh, to get the advice and to uh, to take actions uh, which uh, give uh, effective uh, impact on the ground and uh, as you just outlined one of the still persisting challenges is the finance we hear we heard and we will still hear in the future about the challenges of the climate finance but looking at the solutions we found also in COP28 one of the most prominent innovative solutions coming uh, from UAE initiative which is Altira fund which supports the innovative climatic solutions. And we hope that this can help the globe in meeting such challenges and providing some success stories, stories that can be replicable everywhere, especially at the micro scale and small scale uh, communities. Uh, having said that, I think uh, we are running out of time. So now it's time to open the floor for our distinguished audience we can get some uh, questions. Thank you for your insightful and rich offering, Dr. Amina. Um, I just want to bring something to our attention here and also get your context here. Um, most of the time, we as uh, Emiratis or we as people coming from the Gulf countries, we feel a little bit distance from the SDGs goals. We feel the context does not apply to us and then when we look at it we think only of poverty so if you would speak to that context how does the uae um, context play here in the sdg7 goal the uae is one of the amazing countries around the world which one of its goals is to make an impact on communities and I'm going to just answer your question from the research perspective, at least to what I have seen recently. Now, what I noticed now currently, uh, some of the websites try to classify the research in relevance to how does it serve the sustainable development goals. 
And at the personal level, when I came in, I say, well, this is really very interesting because even for the UAE nationals, the UAE researchers, they're going to notice they're conducting research areas which actually fits into the sustainable development goals and which makes people even who didn't dig in into these goals to go and read more about what are actually they're doing or do they have any research, other researches which has which is really aligned but hasn't been observed yet. So that was at least from my personal experience with working with the with looking with, look, with exploring the SDGs and the alignment of my personal research with it. We can take one more question. Thank you so much, Dr. Amina, for such a fruitful talk. Um, uh, I have a question regarding the a few. We, we, we've been hearing a lot very recently about the thorium reactors and how they contribute to the production of nuclear fuel. Do you think this is some um, ways uh, or some way to um, to contribute to the SDG seven? Well, um, to answer your question, I think this is more relevant to the application and where is it really actually applied. For example, if you're talking about poverty, is this option really reliable or affordable? One of the things that I mentioned is the high capital cost of investment. Unless you want to really transport the energy that you're really producing in one form or another. For example, if you can think of transmission lines from one country to another, then, well, whatever electricity you're generating could be definitely transmitted. But if you look at, for example, countries which are suffering from poverty, perhaps they don't have even the financial resources to go and implement a nuclear power plant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Amina, and thank you uh, very much for our distinguished audience for raising such uh, insightful questions. Uh, Dr. Amina, before we leave, what message you would like our audience to take away in just a minute? Well, think about the humanity and the impact you want to really make. When I started working on this sustainable development goal, my, my goal wasn't really on the commercial perspective at all. My goal was is really to make an impact on community. Why don't, when I think about the idea, why don't people have access to education? It's just a basic need. We're not asking them to get jobs. We're not asking them to get whatever. But at least education is a right for everyone. So imagine that in the future, like you have your kids living in the dark without being able even just to go to school because of the lights. And then I said, well, this is a really deserved challenge. Like, it's really a challenge. I, and I really am interested in that problem. And I really want to solve it. OK? I want to see how far we can go in that. It was really challenging at the beginning for me because I was uh, completely new to the area. But later on, I said, OK, my goal is the impact. If I want to make an impact, then I should give it all I can to make that impact. And then again, of the day, day, we have lived in a country that has provided us with everything. When we look at other countries which lack the resources, our focus is like, how can we do an impact on these countries? Okay, in appreciation to whatever UAE has given to us. That's all. Thank you, just on time, just one minute. <laughs> okay, uh, at the end, uh, we would like to thank you very much, again, uh, Dr. Amina, for being with us today. And thanks so much for our distinguished audience for uh, your uh, kind participation and uh, amazing questions you have shared and it reached the discussion and we hope to see you again in our upcoming events thank you, thank you.